Hey guys, Filthy Robot here with another fan chosen uh, guides, tips, and tricks video. This time we're talking about liberty versus tradition and openings and liberty versus tradition gameplay. Um, let me just start off by giving you a quick overview of how the video is going to go. I'm going to talk about the strengths and weaknesses of uh, tradition and liberty. I'm going to talk about uh, the core game mechanics. I'm going to talk about uh, making the choice between liberty and tradition. And then I'm going to talk about maximizing your gameplay uh, after you've made that choice. I want to start off with a quick disclaimer. Um, this is a guide designed for multiplayer Civilization V, and primarily six-way free-for-alls on quick speed using the No Quitters rule set. Uh, no Quitters is a Steam uh, group designed for playing Civilization V online. Um, and it expects that your opponents are fairly reasonable at the game, and it is very, very theory heavy. I will be linking you guys to an example of a recent Liberty game that I played that was a fairly strong Liberty game uh, to talk about some of the choices, uh, or at least to demonstrate some of the choices and uh, repercussions of those choices that we're going to talk about in this video in actual gameplay footage, but that won't be directly a part of this guide. You'll have to reference that after the guide, after you watch this guide. So again, this is going to be a fairly theory heavy guide, so if you're not into that, you might want to tune out now. All right, so let's start talking a little bit of the strengths of uh, tradition versus liberty. Um, first of all, those are really your only options in the, open, in the early game. You're going to be available to open up tradition, liberty, honor, or piety. These are the four uh, social policies that can be opened fairly early. Um, and realistically, you're never going to open piety or honor, except maybe on Raging Barbs, one point in honor is sometimes okay, but even that's kind of a little sketchy. But anyways, and the, the main reason is there just isn't the... Uh, early game benefits that you need in honor or piety. There isn't the gold, there isn't the growth, there isn't the production, there isn't the there isn't any of those really key core things that you need in the early game to get your uh, your empire rolling. And if you open piety or honor, you're going to be very, very slow starting relative to liberty of tradition and probably unrecoverably so. So in real re reality there's two primary options to pick between when you're going to be uh, opening social policies, those are tradition and liberty. Alright, um, Let's talk about the strengths of tradition. Tradition is a growth and science oriented uh, social policy tree. Um, it excels in centralized production and centralized production means that you're gonna have a few core cities that are going to be very good at production. They are likely to be able to do things like produce national wonders uh, and produce world wonders, both of which are quite uh, strong in Civilization V. Um, you're probably going to end up, if you're doing a tradition uh, build, with somewhere in the vicinity of four cities. Now. A lot of times you'll see in my tradition games that you end up picking up maybe six or seven, but you probably start out with three or four core cities and then eventually plant a couple more cities. Occasionally you'll have really crazy tradition games where you have endless land and no neighbors and you can plant as many cities as you can possibly afford, and that's strong play too. But in general with your tradition games, the way the land is going to work out is you're going to have somewhere in the vicinity of three to four cities to start and then able to plant maybe one or two later or take over a couple later. Um, and you're going to be able to be particularly uh, able to work specialist slots, which is something that Liberty very much struggles to do because you're going to have the population in your city. Specialists are a bonus kind of for the cities in the sense that you tend to have to work core tiles regardless of your city and then excess population can be put into uh, working uh, specialists and tradition tends to have the excess population and liberty tends not to. Um, I suppose I can talk a little bit about why uh, tradition has these strengths and it's very much the, the, the social policy tree of course um, and it boils down to a number of um, uh, early things here, right? The first is landed elite. This is a great uh, ability for your capital. This is going to increase uh, growth uh, in your capital, um, which in of itself is good. It means more population. It means faster population. It means more uh, more people, more science, and of course, as we know, growth equates to science in Civilization V. Uh, all the science buildings basically deal with um, either multiplying the science you're making or adding science based on your population. So population is always going to be a very strong mechanic for generating science. Um, and then there's the liberty, or excuse me, the tradition finisher that's very, very important too for growth. And this is 15% growth in all of your cities and free aqueducts in the first four cities. Now the wording's a little odd on this. Um, first time you read it, it sounds like your first four cities get a free aqueduct and 15% growth, but uh, I assure you it is 15% growth for all of your cities, although the, aqu the free aqueduct is only in your first four cities. And the free aqueduct is actually surprisingly good. Uh, you don't require engineering tech to get the free aqueduct, um, and it is uh, free in the sense that you spend no hammers on it, no upkeep on it, and no hammers on it. It, which are both very very important things. Um, all right, so these are the strengths of tradition. We're going to talk. We're going to get a lot more in depth about these uh, policies as we continue on the guide because there's going to be a lot of comparison back and forth between tradition and liberty. But I want to start with just kind of outlining the overall strengths that tradition play is going to have. Um, and the, the kind of 
emphasis on growth in science is going to mean late game advantages, right? When those, when those, the tech amount that you're producing starts really adding up relative to your opponents. Uh, when your population gets ridiculous and you have the science to do this, you're going to start seeing, especially as the game gets longer and longer, tradition pulling out further and further ahead of liberty in terms of science. And as we all know, uh, in multiplayer Civilization V. Science tends to lead to military text. Military text leads to wiping players out of the game. And at some point, tradition is going to uh, generally surpass liberty in its ability to produce science and therefore get to these later military texts and win the game. Um, all right, let's talk about the liberty early game, though. Let's talk about the strengths of liberty. Liberty is an early game uh, social policy tree um, in the sense that a lot of its bonuses apply very much to early and mid game and taper off as the game continues and tradition tends to surpass them. So what does Liberty have going for it? Liberty is not a growth in science oriented civilization. I know people are going to say well uh, small cities grow faster than large cities just because of the way the growth curve works and that's true uh, but the thing is you don't have the support for making that growth uh, to facilitate that growth. So yeah, I suppose if you had endless land and you could just plant city after city after city and you had the luxuries to support this and the happiness to support this and no neighbors, etc. Yeah, Liberty could grow its population in a way that would be competitive to tradition, but in reality you can't do that because there's other players in the game. Land is limited, luxuries are limited, other players uh, will contest you expanding to their borders, etc. etc. But what does Liberty really have for it? Liberty has uh, production going for it, and it has decentralized production. Decentralized production is kind of difficult to take advantage of. So what do I mean by this? Well, Liberty gets the, the plus one hammer for each of its cities. Okay, that's something. Um, and it gets, uh, you know, 5% production in buildings when constructing, or in cities when constructing buildings. Okay, that's also something. I mean, these are these are both production bonuses that add up, especially if you have more and more cities. Um, they also tend to prioritize uh, their tiles a little differently. Gold and production are a lot more highly prioritized in uh, Liberty cities than they are in, in, uh, in tradition cities because you're not looking to grow your cities uh, endlessly like you are in tradition. Tradition, you want the biggest possible cities you can have. Eventually, you have enough people to continue working all of the tiles that you can work. Liberty is much more about focused growth and uh, kind of... Um, they're not really specialist cities in the sense that they're not working specialist tiles for sure, but they are specialist cities in the sense that they tend to have a purpose. You know, this city is going to be generating hammers, this city is going to be working science, whatever it happens to be. Um, but Liberty has a lot of decentralized production. When you plan a lot of cities and you have these inherent bonuses to your cities already, I like Republic here, um, and you get the base, you know, the city, the way it works with the city is you plant a city, the tile that you plant on, the yield is added to the city, and then each uh, um, citizen in the city, in addition to that, can work another tile, basically. So um, if you plant lots of cities, you have a lot of base tiles that are essentially free. The, the population isn't uh, required to work that production. But decentralized production basically means you have a lot of hammers spread across a lot of cities, as opposed to a smaller amount of hammers spread across a very small number of cities. So whereas tradition tends to have a lot of production per city, although it may not have a lot of total production, liberty tends to have a little bit per city but with a lot of cities to make a larger overall amount of production. Decentralized production is very difficult to use because it doesn't let you do what normal players are doing in games. It doesn't let you sim city very efficiently. It doesn't let you spam science buildings. It doesn't let you spam production buildings because you have to build each of them maybe 10 times instead of four times. If you have 10 cities and some tradition has four cities, then you're gonna be doing that. You're gonna be building those basically. You have to build your workshops in each of those cities, which is 10 times the cost of the workshop as opposed to tradition, which has to do four times. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more shortly about what this kind of means. But anyways, take my word for it. Liberty is, is fairly good at decentralized production. It has a lot of overall hammers in its empire. Um, Liberty is good at faith generation. Faith generation basically scales per city. Um, now there's exceptions with things like uh, pantheons and uh, you know the, the, the terrain that you're a part of. But in general, what you have for faith production is you have a shrine, maybe a special building, and a temple. And that's basically it. You know, you have pantheons as well, and that's something. And you can later on, you know, do other things with your religion to increase that production, or excuse, increase that faith production, like uh, pagodas or mosques or something like this. But in general, what this means is that the more cities you have, the more faith your empire can create. Um, and liberty, since it has more cities, has more faith generation, at least when it's done right. Uh, liberty also excels at rapid expansion. The bonus, uh, the early hammer is actually very, very significant early game, of course, um, that plus one hammer. Uh, if you only have eight production in your capital, uh, plus one is quite a bit. If you only have six, it's quite a lot. If you have 100, plus one is not all that much. So in the early game, this is, of course, a disproportionate uh, disproportionately good in the early game. Um, collective rule is also very, very strong in the early game. This gives you one free settler and then uh, allows the, basically your hammers that you put towards settlers are doubled in the capital. Um, 
which means that you can expand faster. So Liberty excels at rapid expansion just from the social policy tree that uh, the social policy choices that you have. Um, Liberty excels at maximizing the space in a way that tradition doesn't. Tradition, you tend to plant tradition cities in a way that means they're gonna, you're, you're planning for future growth of that city, right? You're planning on the borders expanding, you're planning on uh, the population expanding in the city, and you're going to use the lands that it expands to, you're gonna use them eventually, but you're not probably using the bulk of them initially. And as your city grows, your city probably is, um, growing, the borders are growing faster, you have more land and then they're going to be working with the number of citizens you have almost always in tradition uh, tradition cities. And Liberty cities, you really don't. Um, you tend to maximize the space you're given. You don't plant cities uh, six or eight tiles apart. You plant cities four tiles apart, the minimum distance you possibly can. And you're doing this because your borders do not expand quickly, your population does not grow quickly, and what you're doing is you're planting next to the tiles that are extremely important for you to be working. Liberty tends to plant near hills because the uh, the governor the, that governs the border expansion of your cities doesn't prioritize production very highly. It prioritizes growth to some degree. It prioritizes these um, these bonus resources, and to some degree, it prioritizes things like strategic resources, uh, like uh, you know iron, coal, or this type of stuff. And then also it prioritizes luxury resources like. Uh, you know, ivory or whatever your luxury resources be. But what it does not prioritize is hills. So, um, and that's true for both liberty and tradition governors. But with the tradition game, you tend to have the goal to either purchase some hills, you have enough culture that it will eventually expand through hills. Uh, and liberty, you don't you don't have that. Your your culture production and your uh, growth, uh, your city border growth tends to be to the point where you're not going to grow very much to production tiles. So liberty players, to make sure their cities have production, tend to plant close to production oriented areas, and that's kind of important for liberty. Um, but the way that works, since you have uh, these closely packed cities, is you can get a lot of cities into your land, a lot more cities than tradition players tend to get in the same amount of land. So they're pretty good at maximizing the space given. And then, because of this decentralized production, which really isn't good for buildings, decentralized production doesn't help you for buildings. So what does it help you for? It doesn't help you for national wonders, it doesn't help you for world wonders, and it doesn't help you for buildings. And that's three of basically four things you can only build in Civ. The fourth thing you can build in Civ is military units, and decentralized production is actually very good for building military units, especially if they're military units that aren't going obsolete very soon, because it doesn't matter if it takes you eight turns to build a crossbow in your city. If you're only building crossbows for the next 30 turns and you have all of your cities building them, you're still going to have more crossbows than the guy who can build a crossbow in three turns out of his capital, but he only has a very few number of cities that can build crossbows. So the decentralized production actually is an advantage for liberty in war, because liberty is going to have more production than tradition, and can't use that production efficiently for things like buildings or wonders, but it can use that production fairly efficiently for things like military units where they're spammable and you want lots and lots of them. Liberty also has a very strong snowball ability in a way that I don't think tradition does. Um, if a liberty game goes well, it can often result in a very early victory for you or concede from your opponents because you have the ability to just continue to snowball, continue to take land uh, very quickly and efficiently, uh, use, utilize that land, utilize that land pretty much to the, full, the fullness of that land possibly available, and then continue to add and add to your empire. So, those are the strengths of tradition versus liberty. Um, what are they weak at? Tradition has problems with early and mid-game production. Um, and they also have they also struggle with uh, expanding basically past four cities, with efficiently founding cities past about four cities, and that's mostly to do with these two policies, right? Uh, legalism is a free culture building in the first four cities. Um, this is almost always used for monuments. The way that the uh, the tree comes out, the timing on it means that uh, even with even if you tend to build a monument in your capital, which is sometimes advisable, sometimes not, you're still going to see the, the free uh, monuments show up basically in all of your expands from legalism. Um, but only in your first four cities. So if you're founding city five or city six, you have to hard build that monument, and tradition cities don't have that plus one hammer from collective rules, or from republic rather, so they tend to be fairly slow at early production. And uh, you don't get the free uh, aqueduct in cities past the fourth city as well. So already the new cities that you have to build as tradition have to pick up a monument and a, and a uh, aqueduct before, they're at, before they start on the same page of your other tradition cities. Um, but that is really kind of it, what tradition is weak at. The early and mid-game production and efficient uh, city expansion. Um, and I guess to a lesser degree, perhaps faith generation for the reasons we were outlining when we were talking about how strong liberty is at faith generation. Now let's talk about what liberty is weak at. And this is why you see tradition get picked 
probably 90% of the time uh, that you're playing games, you see tradition get picked over liberty. And that's because liberty is weak at early gold, early science, mid to late game growth, mid to late game tech and production buildings, early game scouting, great scientist and great engineer production, social policies, border expansion, and early game room control. We have basically three things for tradition that they tend to be fairly weak at, and about nine things for liberty that they tend to be weak at. So, all right. So, fair enough. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the things that I find liberty to be weak with. First of all is gold, and there's a couple of reasons why gold is such an issue for liberty players. The first is the free monuments is actually surprisingly uh, impactful. In the early game, you don't tend to have a lot of plus gold. You might have maybe plus five or plus seven or plus ten across your empire. And you and remember, each unit has a gold upkeep associated with it. Each building has a gold upkeep associated with it. Each road has a gold upkeep associated with it. So tradition, just right off the bat, starts with four, well, one, one gold per city per monument. And Considering monuments are extremely important in uh, free-for-all games, you're always going to have a monument in each of your cities. So that's basically one gold per city, straight up free for tradition that liberty doesn't have. Additionally, there's monarchy, and monarchy is an extremely powerful social policy. And this is uh, based on it's one gold per uh, two population in your capital. And this means if you have like eight pop capital, four gold. So this is again, and you start combining this with uh, with legalism. Liberty uh, tradition tends to be sitting on probably eight to ten. Uh, eight to six, maybe somewhere around there. Excuse me, uh, four to ten, four to eight uh, gold per turn more than liberty just at the start of the game from these two policies: legalism and monarchy. Um, additionally, city connections are more efficient for tradition. City connections give you gold based on uh, the the population of the, the capital and the population of the city you're connecting, uh, and cost you gold based on the number of roads between that. Tradition is better at uh, utilizing city connections generally, just because of the growth in their capital and the growth in their expanse. So, city connection gold tends to be better for tradition as well. So. Why do we care about gold? Well, gold is actually science in the early game. If you have a gold deficit, um, and you have, so if you have a gold deficit, you're losing gold out of your treasury. When your treasury hits zero and you still have a gold deficit, you start losing science. Um, if you have enough of a gold uh, deficit, if the gold deficit is high enough and your uh, science production is low enough, you can actually reach zero science. And this is not generally a problem that tradition almost ever has because they have enough early gold generating policies that they don't worry about it so much. But Liberty often runs into pretty high negative gold per turn. And this is exasperated by the way that Liberty plays. Liberty plays with lots of early units. They tend to have lots of workers out early. They tend to have lots of uh, military units out early. They tend to have lots of buildings being built because they have so many more cities than tradition. They're building more buildings and each building comes with a set uh, amount of uh, gold upkeep. So they tend to have a higher gold cost per turn than tradition and they don't have gold generating uh, social policies in their tree at all. So basically in the early game in particular when you're not able to work gold uh, tiles as efficiently or and you don't have markets up and things like this you're going to see that liberty suffers from gold and that gold is often a science deficit. Um, liberty also suffers from mid and late game growth. It's extremely challenging to find the time to build uh, aqueducts in your Liberty cities uh, just based on where they are in the tech tree. They're basically right before uh, workshops if you go down that way and if you're going for the timing tends to be right around when you have universities available and right around when you have workshops available and right around when you're going to be hitting crossbows. Now all of those three those three things right there are basically the tech paths that people go into the medieval from and they're basically going to be based around oh do I want my science for my universities, do I want my production for basically probably military but possibly for uh, science buildings later or do I want to go straight into kind of crossbow warfare and all of those things are competing with the timing to build uh, build those aqueducts and it becomes just challenging to find the time and the hammers to build aqueducts in Liberty cities. Um, and that's going to hurt their mid to late game growth. And in addition, they don't they lack the things like the Liberty finish or excuse me, like the tradition finisher. So their growth is just less efficient. It's just 15% less efficient to be, or rather, tradition is 15% more efficient than Liberty at growing its cities. Um, they Liberty suffers from mid to late game tech and production building issues. And what do I mean by this? I mean that you probably have noticed if you're playing a lot of multiplayer Civilization V that right around the era that you're hitting uh, modern, if you're going a kind of standard strategy, public schools into um, electricity, into Oxford, to uh, radio for modern era, that you get a bunch of buildings that bunch up. And this is as a tradition player, right? As a, a primarily tradition games. You get the public school, the windmill, the factory, the hydro plant, 
and um, a little bit later the research lab all kind of bunch right up in terms of your production queue that you have to get through these the very all those buildings are extremely important buildings they're very very uh, impactful buildings and they tend to get clumped up in your production queue because your, your cities really don't have the production to hammer them out as quickly as you're getting the techs now this is particularly exasperated for liberty because you have smaller cities your individual city production tends to be lower than your tradition cities and it becomes very difficult to keep up on the buildings as your tech progresses through the eras and you get options for the very very powerful uh, kind of mid to late game buildings, your, your, building, your, your cities struggle to keep up with them. Um, Liberty also struggles with early game scouting. Why is this? This is basically based on trying to maximize the Liberty tree. If you are built, if you're really conscientious about, okay, I'm going to go Liberty this game, I want to really maximize my ability to play Liberty, you have to be aware that you're basically rushing for collective rule. Collective rule is the linchpin of early liberty gameplay. And this is because not only do you get that one free settler, but all your subsequent settlers cost less, cost half the hammers they would if you didn't have this policy, which means that you get all of those hammers back for something else later. So what you really want to be doing as liberty is you want to be getting these social policies as soon as possible. And that means you want a very, very early monument. Um, Pretty much you want that monument after your first scout, which is basically turn five, give or take, you're going to be building, hard building a monument. Tradition tends to skip hard building a monument unless you're playing something like Ethiopia, because what you're gonna do is you're gonna wait it's a little bit slower, yes, you, you will wait a little bit longer before you get that monument, but you already have decent border expansion from your tradition opener, and you already have decent culture from your tradition opener, and what you're going to be doing is waiting for legalism as tradition and getting those free monuments, and in the meantime, you can spend that production on something else. Generally, the builds you see going are Scout Scout, uh, and then either Worker or Shrine uh, out of tradition players. And as Liberty, you really need to go Scout Monument, because you have to get collective rule as soon as possible. If you wait Scout Scout Monument, you're delaying collective rule by another four or five turns, which means you're delaying your first expansion by another four or five turns, maybe even six or seven turns, depending on how long that monument takes to build. And then you're also delaying all the subsequent expands after that. Um, tradition tends to, so, so basically Liberty suffers a little bit on that early game scouting because you tend not to be able to produce that second scout as quickly as tradition players can. Um, and this hurts you for things like getting a sense of the land, and also for things like early game rune control, because you, have two, you, don't, you don't have the two scouts that tradition players have out running around picking up all the runes, and runes are very, very powerful early game. Um, Liberty also suffers from great scientists and great engineer production, um, mostly for the fact that tradition, when you finish all of the tradition policies, you're now able to purchase great scientists or great engineers with uh, faith. And Liberty, when you finish all the Liberty policies, does not allow you to purchase any great person. This means in the late game that tradition players are almost always able to purchase engineers, generally in the vicinity of one to two per game. But those engineers tend to be used for uh, very, very important wonders like Brandenburg or um, the or Statue of Liberty or um, Prora or the ideology wonders right around that time are very, very powerful wonders. And and as are the military wonders around that time, things like Red Fort or Brandenburg, stuff like that. So Liberty tends not to have the ability to purchase those great people because they don't have the option that tradition gets from doing that. So that really hurts their great engineers coming out at that time period. And then their great scientists also suffer, and it suffers for two reasons. Um, the first is that uh, you're not able to purchase great scientists from finishing Liberty. You aren't from finishing tradition either. But when you fill out rationalism, you are able to purchase great scientists with faith. Uh, Liberty players tend to suffer on culture, and they suffer on culture because the cost of um, additional, the social policy cost of social policies goes up for each city that you have. Um, and it goes up basically at a faster rate, it's 10% per city, and it's slightly less with Liberty, it's around I think 6% with Liberty with representation uh, fulfilled, uh, filled in. But the thing is, the bulk of your culture generation in six-way free-for-all games doesn't actually come from your cities. It comes from the wonders you've built in your cities, that being world wonders that have culture attached to them, from cultural city-states you control, and then other kind of bonuses around those lines, like basically, uh, um, uh, what are they called? World Congress bonuses and stuff like that. Uh, oh, and, um, and then um, Hermitage, things like that. And Liberty can't get Hermitage, tends to have trouble with gold to control cultural city-states, and uh, doesn't get to build a lot of national one, or, uh, world wonders because it doesn't have the centralized production that world wonders need. So what this tends to mean is by the time the late game shows up, uh, you tend to be behind on, on social policies as liberty relative to a tradition player. And those social policies that you're behind on tend to be the difference between whether or not you're able to finish rationalism. And if you can't finish rationalism as liberty, 
you can't buy great scientists. You already can't great buy uh, great engineers because you don't have tradition filled out as liberty. So you tend to run into this issue late game is what, what am I going to do with my faith because I can't use it for scientists or engineers and those are the very important things you need to be using that for. Liberty also suffers from great scientist production in the fact that it's harder to work uh, uh, university slots in Liberty cities and is in tradition cities. Um, that is the second way you generate great scientists is you, uh, you're basically accumulating great people points um, and you accumulate great people points by working specialist slots and Liberty cities tend to be smaller and that means that it's a harder choice there's better tiles available often in Liberty cities than the university tile so it becomes much more challenging to find cities that are large enough to be able to afford to work those specialist slots and that means late game you're going to be doubly penalized on scientists because you're not going to have them from rationalism and you're going to have less of them from hard generating them and that's going to mean that you're going to have less efficient less able to compete in the science game All right. All right, so that's what they're um, that's what they're weak at basically. Um, let's talk a little bit about some kind of core conditions, core game mechanics rather that you need to understand bef uh, to have a sense of comparing tradition versus liberty. So we already talked a little bit about the border expansion and how the governor does not really prioritize the actual best tiles to pick up. It really prioritizes food too highly and uh, prioritizes some really dumb tiles. You'll see it grow to 1-1 one, one plains tiles or desert wheat or something over the hills that you need uh, that you can actually have some production in the city. Um, you also need to know the difference between global and local happiness. and um, This is a fairly simple concept, although it uh, is not very intuitive. Um, when you settle a city, a city has three unhappiness. That unhappiness is considered global unhappiness. And then you have local unhappiness caused by citizens. Each citizen is one, uh, one local unhappiness. That means when you, when you sound a city, your happiness goes down by four. And it goes down by three global happiness, which is the three for founding a city, and one uh, local happiness from the, the actual follower, the, excuse me, the actual um, citizen who's in that city, that city when it's founded. All right, why do we care? Well, global happiness can only be reduced, global unhappiness can only be countered by global happiness. And you only get global happiness from three to four uh, different sources. You can get global happiness from wonders. If you build Notre Dame, that's 10 global happiness. You can get global happiness from social policies. So uh, meritocracy, uh, which is this one here, gives you one global happiness for each city that's connected, including your capital. And uh, monarchy gives you one global happiness for every two citizens in the capital. Um, aristocracy gives you uh, one global happiness for every 10 citizens in a city. And uh, represent, no, it's meritocracy as well, gives you one global happiness for every 20 citizens in non-occupied cities. So social policy, World wonders, social policies, um, finding natural wonders is global happiness as well. You get plus one global happiness for each natural wonder, and you have a base amount of global happiness. I think it's nine that you start with, but it, yeah, nine from difficulty level on immortal. And those are basically it for your sources of global happiness. Um, and what this means is, oh, and luxuries, of course, luxuries. Luxuries count as global happiness as well. So what this means is that you're really limited on the number of cities you can found by your social policies, your world wonders that you pick up, and the number of luxuries you have available. And what it basically works out to is, as liberty, because you get the one global happiness from meritocracy for each city you found, you basically can found two cities per luxury. And that's the maximum number of cities you can found in your empire. And that assumes that every single piece of local unhappiness you get for every population, you have a corresponding way to counter the local happiness so that all of your global happiness can be used to, uh, to counter the actual city unhappiness. Um, so let's talk quickly about uh, local happiness, local happiness and local unhappiness. Uh, local unhappiness is generated from the citizens in the city. So if you have two citizens in the city, it's generating two local unhappiness. Local unhappiness can be countered by um, happiness buildings, the Colosseum, the zoo, the stadium, the circus, uh, pagodas, mosques, um, cathedrals, I think that's it. Uh, oh, temple happiness, garden happiness, um, things like that, right? All the, so all the, all the, uh, oh, and all the unique buildings too are all um, local happiness as well. So the special, uh, special temple from Egypt, uh, the uh, special opera house from the Celts, etc., etc., etc. You get the idea. Um, 
But basically, you need to know how that works because you need to have a sense of how many cities you can actually afford with the luxuries and uh, world wonders that you have available to you. So that's one of the, the core game mechanics you need to know. Um, the other core game, game mechanics you need to know are faith generation and faith pressure. So faith generation, we talked about this a little bit earlier in the video, faith generation is basically limited by the number of cities you have. Um, there are some exceptions, of course, your pantheon is going to play a large part of your faith generation. So if like one city has a bunch of uh, faith generating resources, that's going to be slightly different. That's clearly going to have more than the cities in your empire that don't. But in general, there's a limit to the amount of faith that each city can generate, and that's based on the shrines, temples, and special religious buildings in that city that generate uh, generate faith per turn. Um, and pressure, we talked about this in the religion guide video, but just as a quick recap, basically the pressure on a city, the religious pressure on a city, is based on the number of other uh, number of religious cities in a tentile radius of that city. So if there's one city smack dab in the middle of three other uh, religious cities, so let's say Taoism is in three cities, and there's one uh, city being pressured by those three cities, it's going to have uh, 9 times 3 for 27 pressure on that city. And the more cities you have, the more pressure, the more cities you have within 10 tiles of a, of a target city, the more pressure that target city receives in terms of religious pressure. All right. We also need to know about the social policy and science cost. Each time you found a city, um, let's see if I can get that mouse over to work. Oh, it's not working for some reason. Well, okay, I don't, I don't need it. It's 5% uh, additional science tech cost per city or puppeted city that you have. So right now, uh, let's just pretend for the sake of easy math that writing costs 100. If I found another city, it goes up to 105. If I found another city after that, it goes up to 110. It's, it's added to the bonus, not, not uh, multiplicative, um, et cetera, et cetera. So what this means is that you're going to have the science cost of uh, policies go up based on the number of cities you have. And that means your cities need to be producing at least the amount of science that they added to make that worthwhile to found in a purely science related goal. Additionally, culture cost goes up and it goes up by 10% for the number of cities you found it. So again, you have to think about that. And if you're trying to break even on your cultural policy progression, then you need to be aware that uh, your costs are going up for each city you found. Um, Finally, the kind of last core game mechanic we need to talk about for this, the rest of this video to make any sense is that culture is science and faith is science. Now, this isn't immediately apparent to um, beginning players, and it took me certainly a while to get my head around this too. But what do I mean by when I what do I mean when I say culture is science? In the early game, culture is growth. It's going to be finishing out uh, liberty or tradition. Both of these trees are oriented around getting you um, cities, cities, good population, population is science. So that growth that you get from these social policies is basically a science investment. Um, the mid-game, you might get one or two filler policies. The filler policies tend to be the least of the direct translations from culture to science because they tend to be filler policies. But as soon as you enter rena Renaissance, you start putting all of your cultural policies in rationalism. And you do this because you can't compete if you don't. Rationalism is a purely science-oriented tree. Pretty much every single one of the first four bonuses, uh, the opener gives you 10% science as long as your empire is happy. Secularism is a huge amount of science games in, uh, in empires that can work. Specialists, humanism generates great scientists faster, which is delayed science. Science, and then free thought is a straight up science boost as long as you have for each trading post and uh, uh, just having universities in your cities. And then finally, when you do finish out rationalism, you A, get a free tech for finishing the, 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 the social policies as a whole, all of them as a whole, and then you get the ability to purchase scientists with faith. That means if you have good culture game, you can get to the critical science benchmarks faster. You can get into rationalism faster. You can get into secularism faster. You can get into free thought faster. You can finish this, the policy faster, and you can purchase great scientists with faith faster. And this means you can get to military tax that other players can't. So when players are buying cultural city-states from you, or they're prioritizing pagodas, or you see them uh, investing in hermitage, what they're really doing is they're investing in their science game through using culture. Um, and then finally, faith is also science. And faith is science for the same reason that rationalism is, uh, the same reason that rationalism is basically that. It's because you can use, you can purchase uh, great scientists with faith later on. And those great scientists that you purchase with faith are not connected to your great person counter. So they're going to be in the, in the sense of, if you're generating great scientists through great people points, purchasing them with faith does not push that into uh, a longer amount of time to generate them from. So if you have faith, if you have a lot of faith in your empire and you have rationalism finished and you're competing against a player who doesn't have rationalism finished, you, you both can be generating great scientists at the same rate in terms of great, uh, great people points, 
but you have the advantage because you have the faith to spend on the rationalism and uh, the faith to purchase great sciences with, and your opponent can't do that. So that basically means that you have a science advantage over them. So both culture and faith are essentially science-related bonuses in the, in the mid to late game. All right, why do we care about any of these core game mechanics? Um, because it really comes into play when we get to the later later eras of tradition and liberty. Let's talk a little bit about making the choice between tradition and liberty. I know this is probably what most people are expecting to get out of this guide. Well, how do I decide? When do I go tradition and when do I go liberty? Um, let's do the short answer and the long answer. The short answer is you go tradition. Now, this is going to be an unpopular decision. I'm going to get a lot of uh, flack on this. A lot of people are going to challenge this opinion and we're going to explore it a little bit more uh, shortly. But the kind of short, if you want the two second, you know, TLDR, what, what is this video saying? Pick tradition. This is what the video is saying. And it's because um, it is extremely hard to get a Liberty game to be competitive late game and actually work. And let's talk about uh, a little bit about making this choice, right? So the first problem with making the choice between Liberty and tradition is the choice comes too early. Because you're obligated to build that monument basically second, um, right after that scout you often don't have the information you need to get a good sense of whether you have good liberty or tradition lands. You just haven't scouted enough of the map. You don't know uh, where your neighbors are or a lot of your neighbors. You don't know where your land ends and city-states start stealing your land or where you hit a coastline or where a mountain range blocks your expansion. You don't know how many luxuries are in your empire as a whole. Uh, you don't know how contested your opponent's lands are. In other words, are they going to be forced to expand towards you or planning to expand towards you because they don't have the room to expand anywhere else? You don't have the information. You don't have good information for making a really critical uh, decision. And what it boils down to is liberty is a harder set of conditions to win games with than tradition is. So yes, you can have amazing liberty games and liberty games that snowball and make you very, very strong. But a lot of the times, you don't know that that's going to happen when you're making the decision between tradition and liberty. And the safer decision, the decision that is going to win you more games just on average without the correct information is going to be tradition. So the short decision is make tradition. However, um, let's say that you know, you're know you trying to make a better choice. You're trying to try Liberty out and uh, you know, you've had good games with that and you can have good games with Liberty. What are the type of things that would make you want to choose Liberty? Um, available luxuries is really important. Uh, if you know, if you can see a million luxuries, you have maybe three luxuries in your cap and there's two expands or three expands right around, you know, three three unique luxuries outside of your capital in that area that you've already explored and you know you can get to them or think you can get to them relatively quickly, you might consider that being a pretty good push towards liberty. Liberty is going to be inefficient with its cities relative to tradition. Tradition with a four or six city empire is going to be easily competitive with liberty in a ten city empire. Uh, you know, you, you, you need probably more than double, maybe even 2.5 is maybe a, a ballpark number that I'll make up on the spot for a number of cities you need as uh, liberty to be competitive with tradition cities, like two and a half times the number basically. So if you're going to be thinking of a late game competitive uh, liberty game, you need to be thinking, well, how many cities can I, how many cities can I get out and where can I put these? And remember, you basically, as liberty, if you do everything perfect and really ma manage your population, you can basically get two cities per luxury as liberty. So that's, that's the first kind of um, thing you should be thinking about. Second thing you should be thinking about is faith generation. So how much faith is your empire likely to be generating? Um, there's a lot of things that factor into that. Your initial pantheon, desert pantheon, is extremely strong for faith generation. There tends to be a lot of desert if you settle in desert, and that means multiple cities can be generating faith. Uh, but there's a lot of strong faith pantheons that you can be picking up as well. Um, do you have a faith natural wonder? Is your faith game going to be one of the, you know, if you have Sinai or Uluru or Kalish, are you likely to be one of the first uh, empires to found a religion? Um, does, your, does your empire have bonuses to founding religion? Are you Ethiopia or Maya or one of these, uh, these civs that have bonuses to multiple cities producing faith. All these things are good things for Liberty. Liberty has a very hard time competing without a strong religion game. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, later when we start talking about maximizing your Liberty play. Um, we'll talk why that's so important, but take it right now on, on faith. <laughs> that faith generation is very, very, very important. Um, where are your neighbors? Uh, do you have a lot of land? It's often hard to tell by the time you have to make the decision, but that's another important one. What is the gold per turn generation like in your early lands? Uh, if you look at like this land, this land is terrible, terrible liberty land, it's terrible city in general, but it's terrible liberty land because there's no gold um, in this in this area. I mean, if you scroll down, there's a little bit of gold down here. This gets a little bit better when you start seeing uh, things like calendar resources. But early game, you're going to be hurting as liberty if you don't have some sort of gold generation. Ideally, gold generation that you can settle on, like gold luxuries. Because remember, uh, 
early game, you're going to have more units and more buildings and less free gold than tradition players are, which means that you can very easily get to a point where you stop your science almost entirely or stunt your science to a point where you're not going to be competitive. Um, all right, so available luxuries, neighbors, civilization bonuses, faith production, and gold are all pretty solid things to be thinking about when you're trying to make the liberty tradition versus tradition uh, play. Perhaps another thing to be thinking about is the relative strength of your opponents. Um, I am going to advocate here shortly that optimal liberty play, like best liberty play in six-way free-for-alls where there's limited land and limited players, uh, or limited land and limited space for your, your expansion, is, is military based and this is basically because I don't think in general with except some very rare occasions you have enough land as liberty to be competitive with tradition players at all in a six way six way free for all which means you have to absorb land which means you have to go to war um, so you should be aware of who you're facing if you're not very good at war and there's a bunch of players who are very good at war you might consider that perhaps liberty isn't going to be uh, a strong pick for you because you're likely to have to conquer your neighbors to get the benefits that liberty is going to give. All right, so let's talk a little bit about maximizing tradition and maximizing liberty once you pick them. We'll talk about tradition first. I know that this is basically turning into a bit of a liberty guide, but um, tradition, I think, is a better understand set of social policies than uh, liberty is. So I think uh, it makes some sense why we're talking more about liberty. But let's start with the maximizing your tradition play. Uh, maximizing tradition play, you probably want to get three to four cities out in a national college followed by another probably two to three expands if you can afford it. If you're sitting on six city tradition, you're generally in a very, very dominant position because your late game is almost always assured if you have six strong cities and you got your national college out early. City placement is extremely important for tradition play. You're going to be wanting to think about defensive positions for your tradition. You have a lot more... Um, leeway in your city placement as tradition than you do as liberty because your border expansion tends to actually be real border expansion. You can place a city and go, okay, well, if I place it, you know, say I want to place a city here, I'm pretty assured I'm going to pick up at least two tiles out and likely three tiles out of my city. And when you plant liberty cities, that's often not the case because your border expansion is weaker, just straight up from the social policy. And then uh, also, uh, well, basically that because your border expansion is weaker and you don't have the gold to uh, buy tiles in the same way that tradition tends to have. So as, as tradition, you can place your cities in a defensive posture and purchase out the tiles you want to work in an easier way than you can as Liberty. Liberty tends to need to settle close to or on top of the things that you want because your borders aren't going to expand out to those locations. Um, as tradition, you're playing a growth and science oriented game. This is pretty straightforward. You know how to grow cities. You know that growth equals science. You focus on growth throughout the game, and you tend to have the population and the science to be competitive in the late game. You tend to focus on internal trade routes as tradition. You want to be sending food to each of your cities, if you can, or to your capital, or maxing food to your capital, etc., etc. Basically, you want to be using caravans and cargo ships for food trade routes, because you don't have to send them for gold. You have enough gold as it is, and the food is more beneficial long-term to your science game than the gold is. Um, you tend to have a huge capital as tradition, and you need to have a huge capital of tradition. First of all, that makes monarchy just overall amazing. It makes your city connections better, and it allows you to compete for, for wonders. And wonders are basically uh, infrastructure investments. They're things like happiness, global happiness, which you can't get anywhere else, or global growth, or uh, military-based wonders, or gold-based wonders. You know, there's all sorts of things you can do with natural, uh, with, uh, with uh, wow, don't think, grab the words. Um, they're not natural wonders, what the hell are they calling? With the world wonders that everyone can build. Um, and tradition cities are better at building wonders. They're better, A, because aristocracy is a percent production bonus, and they're better, B, because the, cap the cities tend to be larger and therefore have more production in the, in the centralized area, which is how you build uh, build um, those types of wonders, world wonders. Um, tradition tends to be able to build national wonders in a way that liberty can't. You might be able to get your Circus Maximus out as tradition. You might be able to get your Ironworks out as tradition. You're definitely going to be able to get your uh, National College out often earlier than liberty as tradition. You're probably going to be able to fit in a Hermitage if you want it. You might be able to fit in some of the really crazy ones like uh, um, National Intelligence Agency or things like this in a way, or uh, in, like in Hermitage, that in a way that you're probably not going to be able to as uh, liberty. Um, you tend to play a defensive game as tradition, and you should be thinking about a defensive game. Not defensive in the fact that you're never going to attack someone, but defensive in the fact that you are 
taking the land you need and then developing it in a way that doesn't require you to go to war to be competitive. Because your cities are, and you once you have your four to six core cities and you have, uh, you know, you have the land, you can be pretty confident that your science is going to be very strong. And if you focus on things like culture and faith as well as developing your land and growth, then what you're probably setting yourself up for is a very strong late game, which means that you can go to war when you have the monster units like uh, stealth bombers or XCOM or bombers or nukes, the units that are game-changingly strong in ways that crossbows or knights aren't going to be. Um, so as maximizing your tradition play, yeah, take out weak neighbors if you can, take expansions where, where you can, but in general, you're not setting yourself up for a game that requires you do military to win. Um, and finally, maximizing your tradition game, focus on growth, focus on happiness, and focus on culture, right? And then focus on faith as well as you can. Those are the things that are going to maximize your science game for the late game. All right, so what can you do to maximize your liberty game? This is a hell of a lot more challenging um, and a lot more complicated than maximizing your tradition game. Um, maximizing liberty, a general rule of thumb is you want as many cities as you possibly can get because you really want basically two to three times the number of the tradition players you're going to have. Um, you want goal per turn boosters. This is extremely important. Um, if you have to prioritize uh, wonders as liberty, you know, if you want to like a kind of thought process of what you should be thinking about, you should be thinking about early goal per turn, happiness, global happiness in particular, faith per turn, and things like pyramids if you can. Um, tradition overlaps pretty heavily with that. They also are going to want things like happiness and growth-oriented wonders, and of course picking up things like gold wonders are never a downside for tradition, but as liberty you really should prioritize those if you can. Um, you should be thinking about global happiness boosters, uh, not only the wonders we talked about, but also finding national uh, natural wonders, uh, thinking about social policies that matter, things like that, getting luxuries. Uh, it's actually a little easier in liberty games in free-for-all in, in the sense because you can trade for uh, for luxuries that you don't otherwise have. So if you can get early trades, that can really help uh, offset some of the early um, unhappiness. Um, you should be really focused on early city-state abuse and absorbing land if possible. You're in a better position early game as liberty than tradition to be doing things like tributing city-states or even capturing city-states. And this is because your early game hammers are better. You First of all, you have the flat plus one per city. Second of all, you're spending less of your uh, overall production on uh, settlers. And third, you're probably less growth-oriented and more production-oriented than tradition players early. So, you know, and fourth, you get faster workers who come out sooner, et cetera, et cetera. But basically, you likely have hammers to put into military that tradition players are going to struggle to find to put into military, which means it's easier for you to get top military score, which means it's easier for you to get tributing. And tributing can snowball very quickly. You can then use that gold to either purchase more military or otherwise uh, purchase things that are going to help you produce faster. So you can get some sort of tribute train going if possible. You should abuse the hell out of city-states. Um, you should do that as tradition, but you should also do that as liberty. Steal that free worker if you can. Uh, definitely do that as both the tradition and liberty. Consider leaving the war open and taking a city-state out early if you want as liberty. Uh, considering doing things like if you if you generate, let's say you take out a city-state and you're not planning to go to war with players anytime soon, you kill a city-state, capture it, and that's a decent city that you can uh, annex at some point and work into your empire. Considering generally, consider generaling another unique luxury away from another city-state if you can. Um, Definitely consider tributing workers and gold. Uh, you need to absorb land and liberty as liberty in a way that you don't as tradition. I mean, land is important for everyone because it caps out basically how much science you're going to have based on how much land you have. But it's doubly important as, as liberty compared to tradition because you're so much less efficient at generating science in your land than tradition players are. Um, faith generation and religion is extraordinarily important as, important as liberty because what you really need as liberty is you need some way to compete with the devastating gold, culture, and science loss that you get as liberty relative to tradition. And there's a couple ways to do that using uh, faith, right? So let's talk a little bit about that, because I think faith in liberty games is really, really important. First of all, you could do something like pick up a Reformation belief, and this is really useful for a number of reasons. The first is if you have any lost science in the early game, you're likely not hitting Renaissance very, very quickly. This means you're probably a little late to medieval, and then a little late to Renaissance, and the way the early game culture works, that might mean that you have two to three policies to spend 
in between finishing liberty and opening rationalism, whereas a tradition player might only have one to two policies. And that means you could do something like maybe invest in a reformation belief through piety. Um, this is pretty strong for a number of reasons. First of all, if you have a large empire, organized religion is really good. One faith from per shrine and temple is a lot better in a city that has in an empire that has 40 shrines and temples as opposed to an empire that has eight shrines and temples. Um, second of all, religious tolerance, blah, who cares? Second of all, the Reformation beliefs, there's two of them that are very, very good for liberty empires. The first is uh, to, glory, uh, to the glory of God, which is a uh, Reformation belief that allows you in the industrial era to purchase any great person with faith. And that means if you get that Reformation belief, you're less crippled by not finishing rationalism. Whereas if you don't have if you don't have that Reformation belief, you can't purchase great engineers, you don't have tradition finished, and you can't purchase scientists because you probably aren't going to be the finished rationalism. If you manage to take that Reformation belief, that lets you get around the fact that you're competing with players who can purchase engineers and scientists, because now you can purchase engineers and scientists too. And in all likelihood, if you're a liberty empire in a late game, you're probably generating more faith than a tradition empire, which means that you probably can purchase more of those great people, which is actually going to help offset that science disadvantage you're going to be at. The other Reformation belief that I found extremely beneficial for liberty games is uh, Jesuit education. This is a double-edged sword. Jesuit education allows you to purchase um, science buildings. In particular, you can't purchase observatories but, or libraries, but you can purchase universities, public schools, and research labs, and allows you to purchase those with faith. And this is really, really important because Liberty buildings, Liberty cities in the late game struggle to build all the buildings that you need to have built. And they particularly struggle with long build times on those buildings. So this is the difference between instantly purchasing uh, public schools across your entire empire versus having to hard build them at 10 turns a pop or something like that. And the downside of Jesuit education is any any civilization, any player that has that, that dominant, that religion that has Jesuit education as part of that religion in their cities uh, can purchase as well. So if you if you spread your religion to your opponents, they can also take advantage of that. But this may be either something that they can't do because they don't have as much faith generation as you do, or they don't have things like Mandate of Heaven, which you may or may not get, or they don't have uh, just enough cities for this to be meaningful, and maybe it's only spread to one of their cities. Whatever the case, it may be more beneficial for you and for them. But this lets you get around the problem of building research labs and public schools, and to some degree, lesser degree, because it's harder to finish, uh, a lesser degree of getting uh, uh, universities as well. Um, faith is also important earlier and for more reasons than this as well for the liberty. Faith, if you get first religion, second religion, or even third religion, there's three gold generating founder beliefs in religion that can very, very much help liberty early. Um, the first of these is tithe, the second of these is church property, and the third of these is initiation rights. And it's either four gold, it's either one gold for four population uh, that is, is your religion, or it's two gold per city that is your religion, or it's uh, 66 gold for a city converting to your religion. All these things are extremely beneficial for Liberty players because it helps offset their early gold disadvantage. And their early gold disadvantage and mid-game gold disadvantage is often limiting their science in ways that tradition players aren't uh, dealt with. So if you can get a religion to fix that gold issue, that's huge for Liberty. Uh, li tradition, or excuse me, Religion can also fix the culture issue in a way uh, that helps them be competitive with tradition. Um, pagodas and moss have faith, culture, and local happiness built into them. Those are extremely beneficial for liberty empires. And because liberty empires tend to be better at generating faith, you can often purchase more of them or purchase all of them in ways that you might not be able to do in tradition games. And that's doubly useful because oftentimes liberty are a little bit slower to renaissance, and all those buildings cost a set amount until they till renaissance where they start going up in price. So you may even have a little bit more of a bonus as liberty to flesh out the pagodas and moss across your empire. Um, and remember, if you can, can if you can control all of your local happiness, that's the happiness from population, then you can plant more cities on the global happiness. You don't have to waste global happiness dealing with local unhappiness. So if you have a coliseum plus a pagoda plus a mosque plus a temple, I don't know, whatever a special building that gives you two happiness, let's say you're Egypt, you can do something like seven or eight population that costs you zero happiness per population, which means you can put out more cities and it's very, very, very strong. So if you're maximizing your liberty play, I really recommend investing in a religion. The problem with this is religion is very RNG oriented. So yes, there are civilizations that have bonuses to religion and those make better liberty civs than non uh, faith oriented civilizations because they have more options or more control over getting religion. But you can still get RNG out of religion in a number of ways. You can get RNG on your profit spawn. Profits, so as we were talking about in the religion video, spawn based on chance. And yes, the more faith increases that chance, but it's still chance-based every single turn. Um, your starting location is chance-based. You may or may not have faith pantheon uh, 
style things available to you. Let's say you're on a desert faith, but someone else takes desert faith. Suddenly you don't have a very good option for generating faith per turn. Uh, World Wonder uh, generation is fairly random, and it's fairly random who gets to settle them. In other words, someone might settle Sinai, Uluril, and Kalish in a game you're competing, and you might have great faith generation, but there's Ethiopian three faith wonders in the game, and you might not even get fourth religion. And if you don't get a religion at all as liberty, you're going to struggle with culture, struggle with gold, and struggle with happiness in ways that you wouldn't if you have a strong religion. Um, what else for maximizing liberty? Uh, faith generation and religion, we already talked about that. We talked about focusing on GPT and happiness-related wonders. We talked a little bit about uh, faith and, py and uh, the pyramids. Um, you probably are going to use gold caravans as liberty. If you are negative gold, you need to fix your gold issues because gold issues are science issues, and science issues are crippling to your empire. Uh, it's often the case that as liberty, you're going to be sending caravans to city-states or other players to generate gold per turn for you. And that means you're going to be down on food per turn in your empire, but there's nothing you can really do about that. You have to get the gold uh, dealt with. Try to expand on luxuries if you can. This uh, not only limits the amount of time you're unhappy by instantly improving luxuries that you expand on, it often it means you can work gold that you wouldn't be able to work otherwise. If you expand on, I mean, spices or dyes are a pretty terrible tile, you know, especially like plain, like, well, plain sand grass and they're both fairly bad. You know, it's either a two food, two gold tile or a one food, one production, two gold tile before improvements. If you settle on that, great. That's the two gold you get without having to work that tile. You can work production while, or a little bit of growth in production while not having to work the gold but still getting the gold per turn. Um, I expect as Liberty you will be forced to go to war if you're going to be competitive. Um, you tend to want to go to war with the most efficient units for going to war. Early game, that's chariots. Mid game, that's crossbows and frigates. Late game, it's, well, mid game as well, I guess. Late to mid game is artilleries, and then it's info error, like bombers, well bombers aren't info error, but you get the sense, bombers, uh, stealth bombers, XCOM, paratroopers, nukes, stuff like that. As Liberty, you need to take cities early. You need to capture, uh, pre pre preferably classical and medieval, maybe medieval renaissance. You need to be taking cities and have enough time to convert them into useful cities to actually add science to your empire. You need to be very, very good as Liberty about flipping a city from a useless puppeted city into an actual uh, constructive uh, city in your empire. Um, Jesuit education is great for this. Um, and actually better than glory of God in this sense, if you're going to be capturing a bunch of cities. You can bring a prophet with you or even missionaries and uh, inqu inquisitioners. inquisitors. Um, and you can flip cities to your religion fairly quickly as you conquer them and then insta-purchase the science buildings that were lost when the city was captured. This lets you instantly replace the universities, instantly replace the public schools, and instantly replace labs uh, that you've lost in those cities. It allows you to flip those cities very, very efficiently. You still have to wait on the uh, resistance timer, but it does give you a chance to get those cities up and running faster in a way that you couldn't if you didn't have that ability. Um, what else? Liberty excels at war. They excel at war because they tend to have more hammers than uh, tradition empires. By t tends to be a lot. Tends to be you know 50 percent, 100 percent in the early game, and that tapers off slowly uh, towards the late game, where they don't actually tend to have all that many more hammers, just based on things like uh, Statue of Liberty and uh, the super efficient factories and hydro plants and things like that. But in the the early to mid game, they tend to have a lot more hammers. Use these hammers, and these hammers are decentralized, right? So you can't be using them particularly efficiently for things like buildings, but you can use them very efficiently for things like military units. Find military units that don't go obsolete very quickly. Crossbows are a perfect example of this. Crossbows are good in the early medieval, they're good in the late medieval, they're good in the renaissance, they're even okay in the start of the industrial era. You're going to get a huge amount of mileage out of crossbows in a way that you won't out of archers or combos. Chariots are dominant through the ancient and the classical and okay in the early medieval. Um, later, arties are actually going to be, if you rush arties, you might actually be able to kill people before they get to infantry and become essentially immune to your artillery. So, as liberty, maximizing your gameplay, you're probably going to end up going to war you probably should be thinking about which military units you're going to use and how you're going to do that. Um, all right, so how do you win as Liberty? I think this is the final part of what I want to talk about for this guide. Uh, basically, win conditions for Liberty versus Tradition. Um, the thing about Liberty is it needs to snowball. You're not going to catch up to Tradition players in the late game in all likelihood. You have to have so many cities, and the thing is, the mechanics for catching up aren't very good. Um, it takes time when you tap your cities to flip them, uh, into something useful, and as Liberty, you're probably going to have less scientists uh, than tradition players, which means that 
when they hit the, the peak in amount of science, they're going to bulb. They're going to bulb for military techs. You're going to have less ability. You're not going to hit your peak science yet. Your scientists are going to be less efficient because of that. Uh, you're going to have less of those scientists. You're going to be less likely to be able to bulb for those competitive military techs. Um, so as Liberty, you want to do as much conquer as you can early and then spend the time to convert those cities into something useful. If you can remove players from the game, that's great. That's how you want to win as Liberty, ideally. The problem is in a six-way free-for-all, there's five other players in the game. And if they aren't warring each other and eliminating them each other, you, you cannot realistically kill five good players fast enough to prevent someone from getting to the late game techs. What tends to happen is you maybe can kill one, two, maybe three if you're particularly efficient, and then you start stalling out, and then there's still two players left, and they're just sim sitting away, helping your opponents when they can, uh, generating their science. So, honestly, the, the ideal win conditions for Liberty are winning in the medieval uh, renaissance and industrial eras, and winning militarily in those eras, because that's when all your advantages are there, and before the science gets to a point where you're really going to be struggling to compete in science. If you can win in those eras, great. And there's, I mean, there's civs that are bonus for that. Any of the civs that have extremely powerful uh, special military units, I'm thinking England right now, uh, where you can effectively use your hammers to convert them into military and kill people before they have a chance to take off in the science game. The problem is, it's hard to kill five players. And if you start running away and snowballing as liberty, you make a huge enemy of yourself. You have contested borders because you have more land. You have a huge hammer lead, which scares people. You're probably investing in military because you have to build military. You can't surprise people with military's liberty generally. You have to build it a lot because your cities are slow. Each city is individually slow at building units. So you have to build units across your empire. Your army score tends to creep up and creep up and creep up. And if you're tributing already, your military score is probably up there anyways. So people see high military, high hammers, and they get worried. They do things like build great wall. They build things. They do things like place cities defensively. They do things like talk to their neighbors and get gifted units. All these things are detrimental to you. If you make yourself a target, people attack you. If you're religion goes crazy, which it often will as liberty because you have enough cities to spread it, and if you've got good faith generation, people will also tend to fight your religion. They tend to see you as a threat. You tend to make a lot of enemies. It's extremely difficult, to, extremely difficult in online multiplayer play to fight multiple people simultaneously because the first move uh, advantage is a very big deal in uh, online multiplayer play. In other words, if you're fighting three people, that's three fronts. Three fronts means three sets of first moves. Even if you are very, very quick, you probably only beat one, maybe one and a half players to their to their first moves, even if you're guaranteed first move, which you're often not guaranteed first move, which means that your military is less efficient relative to their combined military. It's very difficult to fight multiple people. And as Liberty, you tend to end up fighting multiple people because you generate that threat level that people are dealing with. Also, if players know what you're doing, if they watch this guide or have some strong sense of Liberty, they probably realize that part of the way to sabotage a Liberty game is to, to take his cities back from him, to gang up on him, to otherwise uh, do stuff that sets him back further, because he needs an almost perfect game to win. Um, so how do you win as Liberty? How do you do it? Well, kill a neighbor early, absorb his land, hopefully kill another neighbor in the medieval era, medieval uh, renaissance slash industrial era, maybe even two more neighbors if you can. If you can kill all your neighbors, great, but it just tends not to be of players with relatively equal skill level, that's a possibility. But if you don't kill all your neighbors, at least kill a couple neighbors, one neighbor, two neighbors, absorb their empires, make sure you have a lot of cities out, and then think about how you're going to actually compete in science. That's probably going to be through uh, faith, because faith is really the benefit that liberty cities have over tradition cities in terms of generation. So how do you convert your faith into something that's going to get you science. Probably faith into culture is very strong. That's going to let you do things like finish out piety to get the Reformation belief, or even finish out rationalism. If you can get Jesuit education or glory to God, that's going to help a little bit. Think about what military tech you're going to have. It's unlikely you are going to get to stealth bombers at the same time that your opponents are ever as liberty. It just is extremely difficult to do that. So find a tech that you're going to try to win with. Maybe it's atomic bombs, maybe it's nuclear missiles, maybe it's uh, uh, great war bombers, maybe it's bombers. Whatever it is, think about a very strong oriented push at that time period. Think about thinking, all right, well, I don't need necessarily to go to labs here because battleships will end the game. Can I bulb? Can I save enough scientists to bulb for battleships and surprise them with a battleship push? Can I do it with a Great War bomber push? Can I set up an artillery push before he gets to infantry? You should be thinking militarily about ending the game because it's unlikely you'll win in SimCity. Now, on the opposite side, tradition is basically the flat opposite of that. Yes, you might be able to get a military tech that wins you the game, but in likelihood, you're not going to have the resources to war multiple players at once until later eras. So, you're probably not thinking along those lines in quite the same way. Um, finally, let's talk a little bit about uh, some strategies that you can use with Liberty. Um, I really like 
uh, the piety related strategies with liberty as I've already talked about. There's also some uh, gold purchasing strategies related to liberty. One of the things you can do is spam trading posts all over your empire and switch off of uh, basically gold production, switch off of hammer production basically into gold production is what you're doing. And what you're trying to do with that is you're trying to use a purchasing policy. Remember I was just talking about finding a, f a uh, um, final technology that's going to try to win you the game. Well, that's basically what you're trying to do. You're basically banking gold. Gold is um, a less efficient resource than hammers in general, less than production in general. But what you can do with gold that you can't do with hammers is you can bank ham You can bank gold. You can keep piling up gold ahead of time, and then you hit the tech, and then you spend all of your gold to just max that that particular unit or particular set of units in a way that you can't do with hammers. So maybe you do some sort of purchasing strategy with commerce or Big Ben or uh, autocracy. Uh, or maybe you do some sort of upgrade strategy like frigates to battleships or something along those lines where you have a military advantage. Um, all right, final thoughts about this. Uh, I'm going to link you a game. It's a game I played as Byzantium. Um, it's a game I played recently where I played a Liberty game. I was actually just messing around with Liberty to practice for the 1v1 tournament uh, that I just recently played in. Uh, but I did have end up having a very interesting Liberty game. You're going to see a lot of the strategies that I've talked about here employed in that game, and a lot of the problems that Liberty struggles with also highlighted in that game. But hopefully you'll get a sense by watching that game of some of the pros and cons of Liberty and some of the things that I did to try to uh, limit the negative sides of Liberty while uh, advance the stronger sides of Liberty, take advantage basically of the situation. Um, there are other Liberty games on my YouTube channel. I, my understanding of the Liberty game has certainly advanced a lot over the last six months or so. So I don't think a lot of the earlier games are very uh, useful Liberty guides, but you might find some that can be that way. Um, I probably will play more Liberty games uh, in the future. I do enjoy the play style. It's different. It's uh, it's fun to do something different. It's nice not always to be forced into tradition. It is very difficult to be competitive with them, but I'll continue to work on strategies for that and uh, perhaps at some point update this guide if it becomes relevant. Uh, but finally, just the kind of the take home message from this is that uh, tradition is better than Liberty probably 90% of the time in the six way in the six free for all quick speed multiplayer games. Um, Liberty has a lot of very situational things that need to occur for Liberty to be dominant. Um, and it's just much easier for the, the, the conditions, the barrier for entry for, uh, for winning the game is much lower with tradition than it is with liberty and it becomes extremely challenging to make the right plays as liberty and the game itself is a much more challenging game than a tradition game because it often almost always involves around winning multiple wars as liberty and winning wars is challenging especially when you play against good players um, but it's possible liberty is a viable uh, opening strategy some of the time and uh, that's pretty cool because i hate being locked i hate being forced to make decisions just based on the fact that there's balance issues um, other than that, uh, hopefully you'll enjoy the game. I'll link it in this uh, this thread, and hopefully you've enjoyed the guide. And uh, if you like this type of guide, uh, come sub to my uh, my Twitch channel. Uh, my uh, subscribers are currently choosing the uh, the guides that come out next based on their votes and their subscriptions. So uh, if you like this, follow me, subscribe to me, and uh, otherwise support my channel. And uh, hopefully you enjoy the guide. Filthy out.